do your calculations and think in terms of evolution, you'll see that this it doesn't help. Not. These little mutations that you have in influenza and uh, HIV and so on are just teeny little single mutations or maybe two types of mutations uh, uh, as B. E. had in connection with his malaria stuff that he was studying and so on. But he points out, sure, fine, you can have these mutations in these organisms that reproduce very fastly and that are in your bodies by the billions. That doesn't explain how you came about. How fast do you reproduce? How long is a human generation for you to get a new type of uh, message? True. Now we're talking about 20 years maybe for human generation. Uh, cows maybe take a little less some time than that and so on. But uh, when you get into advanced organisms, this example of mutation, the simple mutation form, is totally inadequate because it takes these organisms so long to reproduce. And of course they can't be there by the billions uh, like these can. You can have these little small changes. Fine. Do your calculations. When you get into these larger organisms, very slow reproduction organisms, on, you're absolutely not going to be able to do it, even though the 200 billion years uh, that, that uh, mammals are supposed to have been, maybe 300 billion years, mammals are supposed to have been around. You know, how can you produce all these? Well, uh, if evolution had taken place, you should not have these gaps. The video went, uh, discussed that a little bit. I want to uh, emphasize one point here. Uh, I think Paul Nelson talked a little bit about it in the video. Uh, if evolution had taken place, with all this variation, organisms trying to evolve and so on, you should have a solid continuity, a solid continuity, organisms trying to evolve. Most attempts will be failures. We're, we're being very generous to evolution when we say that one mutation out of a thousand is useful. You're facing this tremendous influence of thousands of let's we'll say 999 bad mutations uh, associated with this. Uh, some feel, I don't know, maybe neutral mutations and so on that don't have survival value. They're a problem for, for evolution also in that, in that respect and so on. But uh, as these organisms try and evolve, there should be a solid continu continuity of intermediates. The interesting thing is that when you get, say, a organism that's just a little bit different, ah, feeling tough, they're there. Intermediate, hey, we're missing link, we found another missing link, found another missing link. These are all related to other closely related organisms, folks. The problem for evolution, and I'm probably repeating just a little bit of what we've uh, in there is well illustrated here. This is your distribution of organisms and the layers out there. There's this Cambrian explosion that it's not just a question of, hey, we got all kinds of different kinds of organisms here all of a sudden, but they don't have any intermediates. It's a double problem. They don't have any intermediates. Plus, you require that all kinds form at the same time. So it, it's a double problem here. And to, uh, to emphasize this just a little bit, I use this illustration in the book to tell you about geologic time. This is putting this whole picture on their time scale. My argument is that, hey, I accept your billions of years for argument's sake, although I don't believe in it. Uh, I accept, where does it get you? During the first five, six of evolutionary time, 
according to interpretations of the fossil record, and these are marginal interpretations, uh, especially for the Precambrian fossils. Uh, according according to their interpretations, uh, we have virtually no evolution taking place in the five fifths, first five sixths of evolutionary time. This is a very strange situation we have out there. Uh, we, this, uh, this is supposedly the age of the Earth here. Four billion, five hundred thousand million, uh, and so on, the origin of the Earth, so on, cooling. First life, um, some say three, three billion, eight hundred million, or which is 3,500 million, uh, and so on. And what do you have all through here in that fossil record? Microorganisms. No evolutionary change. And these could be infiltration. I just don't have time going here. Very interesting story here in connection with uh, interpreting it. These could be recent organisms infiltrated in there. They find it in an old rock, and they, they, they date it according to the date they think for that rock. The thing may have been recently fossilized there. But uh, that aside, here we have simple organisms all the way up here. And you see that little crack between those two lines? That's when practically all of the basic animal phyla appear right then. This is not a smooth, long, gradual evolution over time, folks. These billions of years, we've got to do it very rapidly, and I've been extremely generous to them uh, in putting those two lines that far apart. Uh, uh, and then you have most your most of your fossils that you're familiar with are up here. So uh, keep in mind we cannot rely on these on these billions of years they suggest. Uh, they pose problems rather severe problems for evolution per se if you do that type of thing. Uh, just to bring you back to Earth in connection with uh, an actual picture here. This is a picture of the Grand Canyon, right? Right here is that Cambrian explosion. Below this, microscopic organisms, simple forms of life. So all of a sudden here, you have your tribalites, your sponges, your uh, starfishes and so on uh, appear here type of thing. And uh, even right here, you've got a gap, which I'll not talk about right now, per se, but there's a hundred million year gap, and you don't see any erosion for a hundred million years. And it can raise the question, you know, hey, did a hundred million years ever occur? That, that's not the topic we're discussing tonight. Anyway, uh, there have been of late, of late, some rather impressive diagrams in the biological literature especially the paleontological literature that deals with fossils uh, that the students look at, uh, that we call cartograms. You're probably not familiar with these. They are much more complicated than this one I've shown right here, which I just put here to introduce you to the idea. But they compare unique characteristics, synapomorphies, they call them, and so on. They could have unique characteristics and try and say, hey, this organism is more closely related really that one, and so on. And they build these relationships on the basis of fairly sophisticated mathematical models. Uh, and they're impressive because of that. 